I strongly oppose the idea that we should dismantle museums. But it is a fact that, uh, this is what Shiner says, I think I'm quoting quite correctly, out of the revolution came an institution that created art. You put these mm -hmm. uh, altar pieces and these things into the museum, you turn them into art because you neutralize them. And you, remote, you remove that sort of mythical perspective to it. It becomes just an object that you're studying mm -hmm. with. And what led me to, to, th to, to think about this is this, an essay I read by a curator of modern and contemporary art at the Art Historical Museum in Vienna. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because, of course, they are concerned with bringing in contemporary, modern and contemporary artists into the museum so it, they can show that it continues, right? Yes, yeah. And uh, it was, I think this is the kind of thing that you really need to be aware of, how they argue, how they, they um, the arguments that they use to say that Rembrandt is the same as a video artist or whatever today. Because if you don't, you really can very easily get tricked by that propaganda and then, you know. But that is, but that is uh, in a way how to solve this too, because very often if you get to the essence of something, it loses its superstructure and it falls down. This applies to anything. And if we can get mm. the essence out of art <laughs> to the art schools and the institution, it dissolves and disappears. Mm -hmm. Because even though this is like the school in Oslo now, which probably will be taken away um, in a few years because they are going to the essence. What is the essence of art? Yes, it's political correctness. Spirit. Yeah. yeah. And then what they had forgotten was that all of these things, craft, uh, learning how to put up a canvas, all of these things, act as a superstructure for the art. It keeps things together. <laughs> so, so if you can get to the essence of something, you destroy it because it relies on so many things holding it up. Mm. You know, and I think it's I think it's the same applies to you know we have talked about that in classical painting. The essence is storytelling, but if if you go down to the essence, <laughs> I mean you lose the painting. <laughs> so um, yeah. so that's how it works. And uh, and yeah, in that way, even though I'm not a big fan of political correctness, in in a way, it's fun to see the the art institutions destroying themselves. Yeah, well, you can just stand back and, and let them finish the job. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's, um, uh, uh, it's so strange because what happens, you, you get the museums, you take old masters into museums and turn them into art. And now they are continuing that process by, for example, uh, as, as he, um, Sharp is, is his name, writes about, you, they invite contemporary artists to choose from the exhibition their favorites, <clears throat> so we established that they are the experts on old master painting because they are the heirs of the, the old masters. And of course also to exhibit there. So you show that they are doing the same thing. That's the uh, logic, right? And, and uh, also then when they choose their favorite works so-called from the exhibition, then they start making the old master paintings into pieces of their art puzzle. Mm -hmm. So it's like <clears throat> making it even more... And it acts as a superstructure yeah. because the museums, you see it in Oslo now too, the modern museum in Oslo got almost no visitors. Mm. So they had to do something about it. And one solution could be, you know, just like Orban in <laughs> Hungary, he took away the gender studies because he <laughs> thought this is not useful. You know? And then, of course, uh, people, politically correct people all over the West react to that and said it was authoritarian. But, but I mean, if you have a state university, I mean, shouldn't the studies be useful? I mean, can you just make it, up any subject? It should and I guess it, state, yeah. And I guess it is useful for a certain agenda, but that was a seedsprang, as we say in Norwegian. Mm. Uh, because the modern museum in Oslo, they had almost zero visitors. And what do they do? They, they take down uh, the the official national gallery, and they make an even bigger museum, which hasn't opened yet, where they combine it yeah. so that they can, you know, have, uh, <laughs> so that the modern can be on the same place as the, the modernistic can be on the same place mm. as the classical. Yeah. So that is one thing they do to save it, you know, to create an even bigger superstructure around the modernist. Mm. Uh, and the, well, it's um, what I've experienced going into, <coughs> going to the, uh, to the opera in Vienna. We went there, Boris, Colin and I went there to see uh, um, Janis Kiki, 
Mm. But of course, before the break, they played uh, Schönberg's Jakob, Jakobsleiter. Mm-hmm. So you had to go through that to get to yeah, what yeah. you wanted. <laughs> that is an old concert trick. You, you take <laughs> the thing people want to listen to at the end. Yeah. So that they sit through it. Mm. So basically, it's um, well, as long as they don't start destroying these things, it's in some way no cause for alarm that they do this blood transfusion exhibitions showing that Rembrandt now would have been doing video art or whatever. Because I think, it's like, what do you do then? No, but I mean, it's worse. It, it's worse because it's not, like you're saying, it's not physical damage to the paintings, but it's, mm. it's cultural damage. So I think it's much worse. It's, it's just like, what has destroyed the most European cities? Is it mm. the bombing from the Second World War? No, it's not because there has been many wars, but they have yeah. always built beautiful after the destruction of a building. But mm. what happens when you have a culture where you continue to destroy buildings, but what you create afterwards is yeah yeah it's a disgrace on the face of the planet yeah so i, I think it's, it's much worse because it it's changes um culture yeah but then it's okay so practically what do you do i mean one alternative is that you know should stop painting and try to go into cultural politics or become a museum director or whatever to contract it then you spend your whole life <laughs> <laughs> not painting anything, yeah. um, but, but just to make people aware of the the way they argue and the purpose of these blood transfusion exhibitions yeah. that they're doing can at least lessen that damage. Hmm. You know, I've always thought about, you, you become so blind in the presence with, hmm. um, with things. And I'm thinking, who are these people? These art historians, the blood transversions, who are they? Like, um, are, what kind of archetypal people are they? Who were they in history before? That is a question I've been philosophizing uh, a lot about. Because, uh, for example, uh, they say Rembrandt is an artist, but he, of course he wouldn't be an artist today. Uh, an of artist today no. is another kind of person. Maybe an artist today was a clergyman in Rembrandt's time or something like that. Mm. And I think that to beat these people, you have to know who they are. And I remember I had this uh, disagreement with a good friend of mine, which was quite funny, where he had this idea that kitsch painters were very logical and rational, you know, Mm -hmm. because they depict real things, while the modernists were emotional and the rest of it. And I said to him, they're not emotional. I mean, they are pragmatic. (laughs) (laughs) You know, they they are painting in a simple fashion, that's pragmatic because it's easy, mm. and they're painting in the style or also networking in a way where they can come upwards, in the, the yeah. they can climb upwards socially and, yeah. yeah. They're pragmatic. We are the emotional ones. We're, we're not, <laughs> I mean, we're not being paid for, uh, for painting over this painting for the zillion time. And you know, if, if it goes bad with a painting, we can't sleep at night. Mm. Uh, so I thought that was uh, interesting that you thought that. Then, then he hasn't understood the, the roles we are actually in, our real roles, because they can call themselves artists and it sounds like an emotional um, uh, sort of thing, you know, the La Bohème living on the edge and drinking or something like that. But actually, his profession is quite pragmatic. Yes, definitely. And it's more in family with a person in the church in all this, perhaps, you know? working him, his way up in the church system. Mm. Uh, and I, I think also that this art project is highly religious. You know, it's basically, I think what it resembles the most today, uh, museums, is that it's a collection of relics. And that's what they are also doing with Rembrandt. It's not the painting, it's not the story, it's not the painting in itself, even though they claim it through Kant, but it's a relic. Mm. He painted it then. And, and because you have to find the red line, you have to find when, when it all comes under the same concept of art, what do they have to com- have in common? They have to have something in common to be under the same name. And the same, and, and what they have in common is that they are treated like relics. That is what they have in common, in exactly. my opinion. And that's the problem then with the museum as an institution that you, um, they place things there saying this is what you shall not do anymore. That's the whole point. You, when the whole museum or museum thinking comes in, the historical thinking comes in, you are killing a tradition or killing that knowledge and saying that it's not something we do anymore. 
Um, yeah, well, so relics is not about tradition. Mm. No. You know, it's just like those, it's like 20 churches or something in the northern Italy who claim that they have the foreskin from Jesus. <laughs> uh, and, and then we're dealing with relics. It's association, mm. you know, Rembrandt mm. painted this. And you've experienced mm. this yourself, uh, a brilliant Rembrandt painting uh, of um, David and Saul where David is playing on the lyre and, and, and Saul is so gripped that he, he, he Christ, cries. Yeah. Uh, and a brilliant painting and they took it down when it was disputed whether it was Rembrandt or not. And that is just like a guy coming to this church and says that, oh, new science shows that this foreskin might not belong to Jesus, but Judas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 ah, we have to hide it or something like that. <laughs> But but it's interesting to 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 um, see how they can connect Rembrandt and Rothko, like a typical example. They did that in, in Vienna, um, and what I noticed with that that essay by the, this curator is that I, I suddenly understood. It's, it's I mean it's quite clear from before, but it, I, it became clear to me then that he, they just use words that are large enough to encompass whatever so that for example uh, instead of these these painters coming into museums to study the craft and learning mm -hmm. the craft he's talking about that they came there to participate in the the conversation that had happened across centuries and so someone who comes in to study the craft or someone who comes in to mm. destroy the craft are doing the same yeah. thing because they're part of a conversation and uh, it's, okay, so as long as you are, if you're not so not devote your life to actually going into a museum and physically change it and, and influence it, I think the best solution is to, is to understand how they argue so that you can counteract the, or not be persuaded by that propaganda. Mm. Because if not, I mean, so many painters can be tricked by that and start to doubt. What I mean, most themselves. people eventually. They give up and just um, accept the institutions in which they are born into. So, mm. uh, but I think th I think the the museum, you know, this I, I love museums, but mm. museums problems goes actually back to its own word, museum. And you know, that's very f funny. I was recently in Bergen, and only Norwegians will understand this. But uh, I met my mother, and I was with my friend, and she said, "Yes, I was just as at Museplassen." And Museplassen, uh, where the hell is that? But then she had not seen this line of the E, so it was Museplassen. Oh, okay. Uh, because that's where the museums are. But it actually means the same. Yeah. Because the museum comes from the word muse, which yeah. comes yeah. from the muses, you know? Mm. And the muses, uh, they are very closely attached to the artist liberatus because the museums, the, no, I'm sorry, the muses, they were, what was it? It was epic poetry, it was history, lyrical poetry, music, comedy, tragedy, dancing and singing. Uh, well, the, their numbers vary, but they're supposed to be like nine, is it typical? Yeah, 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 it's nine. And astronomy was one of them, and one more. But it's, so it's mostly written language and music and dancing, and, and very similar to the Altus Liberatus later, you mm. know, music composition and and writing and etc. You know what you could call quite clean <laughs> professions, not dirty like painting or sculpting. Mm. And uh, of course, you know the story as well as me uh, that uh, artist liberatus, which is very closely attached to the muses, uh, the painting was not accepted within that for a long time. And those that were in artist liberatus, they are quite like quite abstract. You know, like music or literature, or it's much more synthetic than painting. Painting yeah. is much more physical and grounded. So I think th the problem began already then, in the 1700s, when they included painting and sculpting in the Arts Liberatus. It, it's not necessarily a problem in itself, but uh, the abstract language or the abstract way of treating this subject <laughs> sort of... Um, sort of uh, affected the painting mm. and I think it's a strange relation that it's also around that time that you get uh, this uh, very strong naturalism in Europe uh, well, with Angren and all those 
people that you haven't actually seen before in history, mm. this very clean way of treating painting, that painting becomes less sweat and, and drama and more pure. So I, I've been thinking about something that John Constable said, where he said that, that uh, well, it, it was speaking specifically about landscape painting, and that tells you something too, that he was talking about the specific discipline, not we artists, blah, blah that it should be uh, judged as, you know, under the natural sciences. And that the paintings should be seen as, as investigations into the laws of nature. Hmm. And I th maybe you could you know, wonder, uh, that would have made the situation much better for painting. I mean, it might have made it even more uh, subject to this topographical demands and everything should be, you know, perfectly uh, painted. But it wouldn't be a problem to paint as such. Yeah, um, I'm um, a little bit skeptical to that solution. Yeah, also, that's yeah, a very yeah. English solution. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I think the mm. solution lies in antiquity itself, mm. the ancient Greeks. And I think the mm. reason why there was no painting muse was because as a painter you depicted stories, mm. uh, so you didn't have to have this inspiration directly. Mm. There is a muse for epic poetry. There's a muse for history. You know, so you gather that information and that inspiration you paint the story so that's why there's not a, a muse for painting mm. because you don't need an inspiration because it's so grounded you depict something yeah because so and but it's still but it, it was still recognized as a poetic form it was mm. you know aristotle talks about painting as uh, poetry i mean he links it between the poetry of um, theater play how is that related to painting? So it's, it's treated with mutual respect, but it's not one of the muses. Mm. So that could be a solution. And I, I frequently, I, I talk about painting as, as poetry. I think it's a very good term. Because, yeah. it's not, because it's not, strictly speaking, craft, and it's not art either. So it's, um, it's poetry. Mm. But then... There's, there's, a, there's something else then with the, with the museums. Because that's where you would naturally, for a lot of people, you would go there to study because there's not much hope of studying it in art schools. Even though, you know, people still think they can go to art schools and learn Oh, you mean crafts. you go to museum to look at paintings and learn from them? Yeah, to learn from them. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a, a problem that, then, then, that they then are uh, doing these blood transfusion ex exhibitions. But I'm not so sure that these things will get much better because they are now trying to change the definition of what the museum is. There's some, I, I saw it was something called the International Committee of Museums, something like that. And they're obviously trying to make museums even more into a woke institution, saying that not that we are conserving objects for the future, but saying that we are a place that are open and it talks about diversity, equity, inclusion, these things, and we should listen to the voices of the community and take, discuss problems that are current, you know, today. Yeah. Um, so so, so it, it becomes this Marxist um, way of presenting. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that, that would be definitely an argument to, to say, you know, get rid of the machines, but of course that's a practical <laughs> issue, you know. Mm. And, and quite frankly, I, I, I'm just wondering about how society develops with the onslaught of identity politics too. It seems that what is happening in America will, is like just something that will happen in the future in, in Europe. <clears throat> yeah. And... But I mean, it is Marxism. Uh, identity politics is Marxism. Yeah. It's just that uh, the Marxists, they... Uh, you know, in the 50s, 60s, uh, the, the downfall of the Soviet Union and everything uh, they believed in, they, uh, they found a new strategy and that was to become intellectuals and go into mm. the universities and um, focus more on culture than economics. That it was what the new Marxists did when the, with the Frankfurter School, you know, in, as a sort of a, a Jerusalem mm. for these people. Mm. And it is Marxism. Uh, Marx talks about that art should uh, have as, uh, has no value if it has not a society function. Mm. And he says that uh, it should tell us what is wrong with society today and how it could be bettered. 
And that's you know? that, that's interesting. So <clears throat> it, what is happening then to the museums? Uh, because this blood transfusion exhibitions have been going on for a couple of decades, but it seems like it's escalating now. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian Salvo also said that at least um, maybe even since the 50s in Chile, they were they got uh, foreign funds to do exhibitions like that. So it was sort of like an experiment to see how if they could do that in museums. I, it sounded to, sounded mm. like to me. But now then, when they are uh, trying to implement even more woke ideas in these museums, it is. I mean, speaking of the Frankfurt School, this is what what um, uh, Herbert Marcuse is talking about in repressive tolerance. He actually starts talking about that we have seen in art already that those opinions that shall not be a part of the discussion are crushed. And he talks about art and anti-art, and we should never censor art, except for what we define as not art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 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 so it's, it's, uh, you can sort of eat this cake and have it too. It can be, be uh, tolerant and be extremely yeah, yeah, tolerant yeah. and, and uh, oppressive towards... But that that is know. the Marxist language. The, the, the Marxist... I think that... I, Marx philosophy is one thing, but the Marxist uh, way of treating philosophy is much more interesting because what he does all the time is that he he completely eliminates everything on the table and puts up two opposites uh, that we have to. For example, uh, uh, when Marx divides people into the bourgeoisie and the labor class, he's he's doing something that we have just accepted in history classes and mm. etc. But it's actually quite horrendous because. You have a very complex society with many different kinds of people. You have some small entrepreneurs, which we usually say they are the heart of the economy. Not the big guys, but the small entrepreneurs. He divides everyone into laborers and bourgeoisie. Mm. That's, that's, that's a quite horrendous simplification. <laughs> and we accept it. We accept that they did it. It's quite anti-intellectual. Mm to make that separation. And of course, this neo-Marxist does the same, that you're either woke or you're unwoke. And uh, the problem with that, when you make that separation, is that then you dismiss quality altogether, because quality is on the specter. It's not, you know, it's not holy or unholy. It is good, fairly good, mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you for checking out this clip from the Cave of Apelles. If you want to watch the entire segment, Head over to kvopelis.com slash donate and become a $5 patron. That will allow you to access all our Dark Flame episodes, bonus material with our featured guests, and more.